Thanks for showing up this morning, and I hope that you find uh, my lecture not only entertaining, but uh, informative. I'm going to do something unprecedented. I'm going <clears> to <throat> do something unheard of. This morning, I'm going to step over the thin blue line and turn my back on my fellow colleagues in law enforcement and tell you how to get out of a ticket. <clears throat> Hey, this is serious biz, all right? <clears throat> and I'm going to use the example of a young lady in the city of Aurora. She woke up one morning and decided that she was going to drive one mile an hour for every day or for every year that she'd been on this planet, which is pretty cool. So she's going to get in her bright red Mercedes convertible and do one mile an hour for every birthday that she had on this planet. She was 91. The second problem was that she decided to do it in a 55 mile an hour posted speed zone. Sure enough, she gets popped by an officer with a uh, laser. By the way, folks, if you get hit with laser, stick a fork in you, you're done. That is one accurate in instrument. It will nail you down to the microsecond. Well, anyway, he pulls her over. He goes up to her and does the, ma'am, I need to see your driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. She goes, oh, officer, she says, I lost my uh, driver's license after my third DUI hit and run accident. <laughs> okay, okay. Can I see the registration for this nice new Mercedes? And she goes, well, it's not really my car, I stole it. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, officer, I, I just wanted one and I stole it. And the owner's in the trunk, I had to kill him in order to get it. Well, by this time, the officer's backing up, drawing his weapon, calling for backup. His supervisor arrives, his sergeant, says, what's going on? He tells him, says, hey, she doesn't have a driver's license, three DUI hit and run accidents, not her car, it's stolen. And she says the owner's in the trunk that she killed. So the sergeant warily approaches the lady and says, ma'am, you don't have a driver's license? She goes, well, yeah, sergeant, here it is right here. Looks at it and looks back at the officer and says, uh, is this your car? She goes, yeah, I've owned it for two years. Here's the registration and the insurance. So he's looking at it and looking back at the officer like, what the heck's going on here? He goes, ma'am, do you mind if I take a look in the trunk? And she goes, no, not at all, Sergeant. Uh, can I ask what the problem is? And he goes, well, supposedly you said that you killed the owner and you've got him in the trunk. And she looks at the sergeant and she goes, yeah, and I bet that lion bastard said I was speeding too. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> hey, try it. If you get away with it, let me know. <clears throat> Cops and flying saucers. Law enforcement's been involved in the UFO problem probably as long, if not longer, before the Air Force and the government was involved in it because that's the one agency that people can contact, the one government agency that people can contact and not only will we answer the phone, but we'll send somebody out to talk to you. There are several good examples of cops involved with flying saucers, and I'm, if you followed this phenomena or this problem, I'm sure you're aware of it. Lonnie Zamora was a police officer down in New Mexico. Excellent case. I think Ted Phillips worked on that case. Uh, Val Johnson uh, was another officer up in uh, Warren, Minnesota, I believe it was. Uh, his encounter ruined his career. And that brings me to another point. This, for a law enforcement officer, and myself included, this is not a career-enhancing problem. If you're unlucky enough to have an encounter or you get dispatched to an encounter, it can literally ruin your career. And there have been several instances where officers have been forced to re either retire or resign from the profession because of what happened to him. A lot of uh, criticism and, uh, and uh, ridicule comes down on the officer because we're looked upon, and rightly so, as credible and trustworthy. And somehow, if an officer gets embroiled in a, uh, in a uh, encounter, he or she all of a sudden loses their credibility. They're no longer trustworthy. And inside the department, the ridicule 
can be really intense. And I've experienced that firsthand. Fortunately, <clears throat> I can give it out as good as I can take. I think my, my sense of humor, if you haven't gathered by now, uh, gets me through a lot of difficult times. The first case that I'm going to talk to you about is an eyewitness testimony. There are no pictures. There is no forensic evidence. The eyewitness is a police officer. Now, skeptics will tell you, or they are quick to point out, that eyewitness testimony is unreliable. And I'm here to tell you that's a bunch of crap. Now, they, eyewitnesses may make mistakes. They may be inaccurate in certain details. They may not even be able to pick out the suspect in a photo lineup. But the fact remains that something very, or they witnessed something very traumatic, and certain details are accurate. And it's a starting point for an investigator. You have an eyewitness to an event. Tom Bove was a Jefferson County Sheriff's Deputy when I joined the Sheriff's Department back in 1978. He had been a Sheriff's Deputy for a number of years before I got there. In fact, he became my training officer. Um, I had not met him prior to. He ended up being a very good friend of mine. In fact, he was best man at my wedding. So that tells you how the relationship progressed over the years. The story that I'm about to relate to you took me three years to get the story out of him because he endured some incredible ridicule. In fact, he was threatened with his job by the sheriff, who at that time was Harold Bray of Jefferson County, Colorado. My interest in the UFO problem, I was involved in it long before I became a law enforcement officer. So that first day that I arrived, and I was a rookie, as they refer to as a newbie, and I was assigned to Deputy Bobe uh, as his trainee. Never met the man before in my life. Now, let me give you some background on, on him so you get a feel for his personality. Tom was a rodeo. He was a cowboy. He, he rode the PRC in his uh, off-duty hours. He rode bulls. In fact, that <clears throat> gentleman convinced me that I needed to climb up on a bull. And I did. <laughs> for 1.5 seconds. <clears throat> but he did that on his, on his off time. Now, if you know anything about cowboys and rodeo riders, they're a very conservative lot. Cops, in general, are very conservative. We're not very liberal-minded, and we hate change. And so Tom was not one to give to fantasy. He was a person that there were nights when, I, when he was training me, he maybe have said 100 words in a 12-hour shift. And keep in mind, I spent more time with him than I did with my wife. We were working 70, maybe 80 hours a week for the Sheriff's Department, 12-hour shifts. So I spent a lot of time with him. It took me three years to get this story out of him. First day that I showed up as a trainee, the other deputies were in the squad room. I get introduced to Tom. And right away, there were some snide remarks. Hey, Tom, you going to show them what the aliens look like? And you could just see the red come up on his face. Well, we got in the car, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to ask him. And I did. And he looked over at me, and he goes, newbie, don't talk to me. I'll talk to you. And we are not going to discuss this. And we didn't for three years. Three years I worked with this man. He never said a word what happened. Then one morning, we were sitting up at Lookout Mountain, <clears throat> excuse me, and we were talking what guys usually talk about, girls, horses, okay, girls. And <clears throat> out, of the, out of the blue, he looked over at me, and we were parked. I'm sure you've seen cops. They park, we, we call it heel to toe, and that's how we were parked up on Lookout Mountain. It was about 5.30 in the morning. He was sipping on his uh, coffee, and he finally took the chew out of his mouth and spit it out the window, and he looked at me, and he goes, you know, I, I saw him. I looked, and I go, you saw what? And he goes, I saw the beans. He goes, I never said anything to the Air Force or the sheriff about it. And here's the story. One evening, Tom gets a call from the dispatch. It says, you need to go to a ranch up, up off of Windy Point, 285. For those that are not familiar with it, that's in Jefferson County. If you go up 285 now, it's a four-lane highway, and there's a sign there that says Windy Point. Well, the ranch was located up in that area. Dispatcher tells Tom, <clears throat> ranchers, and by the way, this predates 911. Jefferson County didn't have 911 back then. 
But the, uh, but the rancher had called the sheriff's dispatcher and says, hey, I need a deputy up here right now because someone's trying to steal my horse and burn the barn down, and I'm shooting at him. Now, that's how the call came out. Sounds serious. So Tom gets up there to the rancher, and the rancher tells him, I, I think it was a helicopter, but uh, they were shining the light down on the barn, and one of the horses ran out on the barn, and they were trying to get my horse in the corral. Now, it's very important, and I'm going to come back to that on, on my next case that I want to talk about. Tom said, well, you know, the who, what, where, and why questions that an officer asks. And he said, the rancher tells him he thought it was some kind of military craft and that it went southwest uh, over the hill. He tells Tom, hey, I shot at it with my 30-30 rifle. Tom said, well, did you hit it? And the rancher goes, oh, I don't know. It looked like it was going down over the hill. It may have crashed. So he followed 285 up the Foxton Road, and then you go south off of Foxton Road down to the uh, south fork of the Platte River. Back then, it was just a one-lane gravel road, barely passable by two cars. If you, if you held your breath, you could get two vehicles to go by. Now it's a four-lane blacktop, and there's houses everywhere. But back then, it was remote. <clears throat> Tom goes down off of Foxton Road. He says he's driving down the road. He comes around the corner, and here's an object, approximately two-story tall house with an attached garage, is how he described it, hovering about 20 feet off the ground. Tom's within about 200 feet of it. He says the top portion of it is rotating counterclockwise. The bottom portion of it's rotating clockwise. And he said I could, it, it was bright enough that I could see movement in the lights. And he's looking at me when he's telling me this. And he goes, Ken, I saw him. And of course, my question was, what the hell did they look like? And he said, all I can tell you is that they walked upright on two legs and they had arms. And he said, there were a couple of them pointing at me. The craft slowly lifted up, disappeared over the hills down towards uh, Kenosha Pass, if you're familiar with that. And that was the last of it. <clears throat> the Sheriff's Department had a policy and it was in effect when I joined them, and that is every call that you went on, you had to do a re written report. If you were dispatched to it, you'd put pen to paper. And so uh, Tom was obligated to write a report. Big mistake. Because when that hit the news, and it did, there were reporters questioning him. There was a lot of phone calls into the Sheriff's Department. Uh, allegedly, two Air Force officers showed up and interviewed Tom. They had him draw a sketch of what he saw. They also had the rancher draw a sketch of what he shot at. Ironically, the Air Force took both sketches with them, but Tom got a chance to see the rancher's sketch before they left the room, and it was almost identical to the one he had sketched. And what he saw basically was two inverted saucers on top of one another, plates. Sheriff Harold Bray became so irate with Tom that he threatened him with his job. He told him, don't you ever, ever do that again. And yet Tom was following policy and procedure. He was obligated to write a report. It's kind of a catch-22 for him. He took a lot of flack from not only the sheriff, his boss, but a lot of his cohorts that he worked with, plus in the community. I mean, everybody in Jefferson County that, that heard about it and, and knew Tom, he couldn't walk into a restaurant at one point without somebody making a comment. And like I said, Tom was a very quiet and shy guy. It's a pretty incredible story. I always wanted to put him on camera, and I wanted to uh, interview him, and I wanted he wouldn't do it. He said if he ever saw another object like that again in his life, he'll take it to his grave. He's not going to say a word just because of the stress that he went through. And it was obvious when he was telling the story that he was still under stress. It was very difficult for him to relate that to me, but we had become very close in three years, and he felt comfortable, and he knew that I wouldn't ridicule. <clears throat> the next case that I'm going to talk about, and I said I'd come back. Remember I told you about that rancher? The, the craft was uh, shining a light down on the barn and was chasing one of his horses. When I heard that story, 
I didn't make the connection, but I think we had an eyewitness to, a, to an animal abduction. My partner, and he's here to, uh, today uh, with the conference, him and I went down to the San Luis Valley. I told you, Murphy's Law. This is my first PowerPoint presentation, so anything that can go wrong will go wrong, guaranteed. Um, we went down to the San Luis Valley. We took an expedition down there to gather information to investigate cases, and we made contact with the sheriff down in Sawatch County. And he said, well, I've got a case for you that you boys might be interested in, and it's a cattle mutilation. The rancher, the night before, had checked his herd. And you'll see in the photographs that the cow has a tag in the ear, in the ear, excuse me, I believe it's H01. With his laptop, he could punch up that steer and tell you when it was born, the inoculation and the state of health of that steer. Hey, ranching is a business. Ranchers depend on it. So this cattle mutilation problem is a serious problem for ranchers. You're gonna look at an animal that was worth about $1,500. He checked on the herd that night. The next morning, oh, excuse me, that herd was about two and a half miles from the ranch house. The next morning when the rancher walked out the door with his coffee in his hand, the steer was about 100 feet from his front doorstep. Now, this is not it, okay? And I, I, I brought this photograph to demonstrate, like, like I said, I hope this also helps you understand and is also a learning lecture. Now let's see if I can do this without messing it up. <clears throat> this is a, a, a steer that died of natural causes. It was hit by lightning. And what you're looking at, oh sure, see, I told you it wouldn't work. Where's my pointer? Right here. What you're looking at, that is not mutilation. Right there, there, and there. What that is is predation. Coyotes and birds have been working on that carcass, and as the skin, I told you, as the skin dries, it shrinks, and so the hole expands. If you look closely, You'll see, here's some bones, there's some uh, soft tissue right in here where the coyotes have been going into the stomach and they have been uh, eating the soft flesh. And they're gonna do that first because they can get to it easy and they will digest it first. Like I say, this is not a cattle mutilation. I show you this one first because the next photograph, you're gonna make a stark comparison and you're gonna see what I'm talking about. So, any questions on this, by the way? Okay, all right. This is what the rancher saw of his steer when he walked out the next morning. Now there's a couple of things to point out in this particular case. First of all, there's the H01 that I was talking about. I want you to look closely at the cuts. And by the way, can you tell that this is a fresh kill? Yeah, you can eat the meat on this. Okay, there's T-bones on here that are edible. This cow has probably been down for about five or six hours. Steer, excuse me. <clears throat> there are a couple of things that I need to point out to you. Is number one, if you'll notice, all around here, no blood. Now you're looking at a steer that's approximately anywhere between six and 800 pounds probably closer to about 700, 750. They contain a lot of liquid. There's none on the ground. By the way, this is how it was found. Um, the night that the rancher went down and checked his herd, which was two and a half miles away, there was a lot of unidentified activity in the San Luis Valley. The rancher himself didn't see any of the uh, lights, but other ranchers had saw mysterious lights crisscrossing back and forth the, uh, across the uh, valley. And that's significant because this is what happened the next morning when he went outside. 
The other thing I want to point out to you is, look at this cut. It's almost, I think my partner said it best. It's almost as if there was a template placed over the face of the cow, and they took an X-Acto knife. Now, my partner worked part-time uh, for um, Monford Meatpacking. He was a butcher. And um, my nickname for him is Benny Ha Ha. If you ever see him with a knife, it kind of gives you chills because he sits there and, kitch, 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 and sharpens knives. And Bob and I have done quite a bit of hunting. We've skinned out quite a few elk, deer, antelope. I am a hunter. I like to hunt. And I asked Bob to duplicate that. And he goes, I don't think I can. Keep in mind, he's going to have to do it in the dark, too. Now, if anybody's familiar with cattle, and you can try this on your own, drive out to a pasture, any herd, get out of your car and try to walk up to them. They're not going to allow you. They'll allow the rancher because they're accustomed to seeing them. But they're not going to allow you to walk up to them. They're going to take off. So the question becomes, who or what was able to capture? This is a healthy animal, by the way. Can you see that? If you look at the fur, you can, at the hide, you can see that this is a healthy animal, and you can tell that it's fresh. I got some more photos here, some close-ups that I think that will illustrate that. <clears throat> I like forensics. Look at this cut right here. It's almost 90 degrees. Now, I showed this photograph to a veterinarian and he tried to tell me that an eagle may have done it. And I, and I look at him and I go, Doc, have you ever seen an eagle do that? No. I said, I haven't ever seen one, and I've been hunting, I'm 55 years old, and I grew up on a farm back in Missouri. I, did, I have do extensive hunting experience. I have never seen an animal carved up like this by natural predation, coyote, bear, or eagle. And then when I, when I pointed this out, out to him right in here, I said, how do you tear a cut like that on fresh? If it's dry and brittle, yeah, but this is fresh. By the way, what you're looking at is crime scene photographs. These were uh, investigated by the sheriff and his crime scene technicians. So these are actual crime scene photographs. These are not my photographs. These are taken by the sheriff's department. And you'll see the gloved hands in some of the other ones. <clears throat>
but that's only speculation. There is no indication that that's how the animal died. I think if you look closely, now this is when they, they, there's some grass that's stuck in here, and that's because they were rolling the animal back and forth trying to determine to find any bullet holes or anything like that. But uh, once again, I want to point to you these cuts. And by the way, if you, yeah, easy for me to work. If you look closely, there doesn't seem to be any hesitation on the cuts. It looks like it was one continuous carve. And anybody that's tried cutting a steak, try doing that at home. Try to make one continuous, try to just try to take a T-bone steak and try to make a circle in it. One continuous cut. Aside from the fact that you've got to have an extremely sharp knife, turn the lights out in your house and do it in the dark, because that's when this happened. There's a good, there's a good example of the, uh, of the uh, cuts. It's a real close up. And I think you can see down here, there's an example of some carterization that it's a possibility that this animal was alive when they were doing it because there was still a pulse and the, and the blood was gonna start to come out through the capillaries under the skin and, and it was carterized. Here's another one. By the way, this rancher lost about $1,500 on this animal. That makes it a felony. So what I tell people, even if it's not ET or alien intervention, who or whatever did this, this rancher was out about $1,500. And the sheriff told us that for every one that we have like this, there's probably 10 that go unreported. The, uh, the rancher will just take the carcass to the bone pile, drop it off, and not even say a word. And the reason why is because these animals are insured. And if, they're, if the rancher reports it, excuse me, as a cattle mutilation, the insurance company won't cover it. He's out the money. If, if he reports it as natural predation or an act of nature, then, then, the, then the insurance company will, will cover it. But if he reports it as being suspicious death in a cattle mute, he gets nothing. And we were fortunate that the, uh, that the rancher called the sheriff's department on this one, and we were able to in, uh, get investigated on it. But one out of 10, and I suspect it may be even higher than that, because $1,500, I don't know about you, but out of, a, out of a rancher, especially in today's economy, that's important, and they're not gonna report it. That's the back end of the, of the animal, and that we suspect that that's where the, uh, the genitals and uh, the stomach were taken out through the back, and probably the heart and lungs. But like I said, you're talking probably an animal about 750 pounds, and it's a healthy animal. I watched Tom Bobe bull wrestle a, a steer that was about 400 pounds. And Tom was a pretty stout boy. He was about 5'10 and about 240. And that steer gave him all he wanted when he came out of the chute to bulldog that animal down. And so I tried to visualize, outside from maybe tranquilizing or stunning the animal, I don't know how you would be able to get the animal down to do, to do that. You'd have to have some kind of either a dart or a, or a stun gun of some sorts. And I go back to the original story that I told you about where the rancher said they were trying to get his horse. I think that was a witness to an attempted uh, animal abduction and possibly a, uh, a mutilation. That's my theory anyway. Now, <clears throat> remember the first one I showed you that was not an animal? It was natural predation and the, and the carcass was dried up and, and was... This animal here has been out in the, in the sun approximately the same length of time, about two and a half months. This is an animal mutilation. 
And there's a couple of things I want to point out to you. Not only does it have the, this is, by the way, this is not the same case. This is just a total different uh, a cow. And you can tell that by the bleached bones here. It's obvious that this animal has been out laying on its side for uh, several months. But there's a couple of things I want to point out to you. Number one, there is no predation on the carcass. The coyotes and the birds have left it alone. And that's unusual. Food's very scarce for these, uh, for these predators down in the San Luis Valley, and anytime they can get a chance to get a free meal on a dead uh, carcass, whether it's a roadside kill or, or a cow that's been hit by lightning or just died of old age, they're going to take advantage of it. You do not see any of the predation on the, on the carcass whatsoever. None. The coyotes, the eagles, have left it alone. And there are no flies. Let me go back. Let me see if I can get this thing to work. I want to go back to this one picture here. Okay, easy for me to do. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Well, I can use this one. Anybody that's been out in the woods and it's hunted knows that when you make a kill, when you shoot a deer or an elk or even a rabbit for that matter, Within minutes, flies are there. They have an uncanny smell. I, I heard from, uh, from a scientist one time that a, that a common house fly can smell flesh or rotting vegetables from like three or 400 feet away. But there are no flies here, none, on this carcass. Same thing is true with this one. This one's been laying out in the, uh, in the San Luis uh, Valley. And by the way, it's a high desert for several months. <laughs> and there's no maggots. I think I have a close-up of this also. Yeah. Now, you can tell that this animal's been out because of the, the bleached bones. And this is obviously not a fresh kill. But if you look closely, you can see the same template, the same type of cut on the right side of the face, same as the, uh, same as the case that uh, Bob and I investigated. Uh, this uh, animal was missing its uh, internal organs as well. Yes, ma'am. And this one here? Yes, ma'am. And they took the tongue in the other one, too. Yes, correct. That is correct. Now, <clears throat> whether ET is responsible for this, a lot of people like to think that it's a government, that it's a private organization, that it's a cult that is doing this. Whomever or whatever is doing it, it's been going on for at least, that I know of, about 40 to 50 years, and I'm sure longer than that, and nobody has been identified as being the culprit, other than uh, coyotes and eagles. Coyotes and eagles are not doing this. Someone or something is, and they're very, very sophisticated. Okay. Right. Ah, yes, sir. There... There was no indication on either one of these carcasses that the animal had been dropped for any, any great uh, height. There was no impact into the ground. Uh, there was no tracks. It, it would be pretty hard to see tracks on this one just simply because the animal, before it was discovered, had been laying out in the, uh, in the elements for almost two and a half months. But the other one had only been down maybe five, six hours, and there was no indication on how that animal got there. Yes, ma'am. I should hook you up with my partner because he asked the exact same question that you just did. She asked, <clears throat> let me go back to the, you'll see it. What she's referring to is this dark matter right here around the head of the carcass. If you notice, it's not anywhere else. It's only up here at the head. 
I first thought it was a blood stain, but it's not. Blood will not stay there for two months out in the hot sun, uh, and uh, it, it putrefies really quick. In fact, it's one of the first um, material to putrefy is blood, and it, it uh, disintegrates very, very rapidly. My, uh, my partner, Bob, asked the same question. To this day, I do not have the answer for you. There's all kinds of speculation what that is, but uh, I can't tell you what it is. I think it's a stain, and to answer your second part of your question, no, there was no soil sample taken, and that's too bad, because there may have had some answers as to, uh, to what that is. Yes, sir? I'm sorry, what's that? I can, I can speak to him, but it would be purely speculation on my part. He, he, he said, could I speak to the uh, significance of the parts that were taken in, in both cases? I, that would be speculation on my part. And, and although I like to theorize, theorize and speculate, um, I could be 180 degrees wrong. Not that I've ever been wrong before. Um, I'll tell you what my partner thinks, okay? And that way, if he's wrong, I can laugh at him. Um, Bob thinks that this is a food, uh, a food source, that because they go after the blood and the soft tissue, it's easy for digestion, which is true. I mean, that's what, that's what predators do. They go after the soft tissue also because they can digest it and get to it easily. Um, but that's just a theory. Uh, I don't... If we're able to determine how it is being done, we may get to the other question as to why it's being done, which would lead us to who is doing it. Yes, sir? Sure. Not that, my, not that I know of, um, and I'll come back to, if I have time, to a case that we looked at that may have included where they took a brain from a horse, but th that was never, yes, sir? There's a, a, there's a microphone oh. here. Yeah, if you, if you want, you can go up to the microphone and ask the question. Yes, ma'am. Has there ever been a tissue analysis done to determine why the predators and flies won't attack something like this? I'm sorry, has there been a tissue sample done to what? Yeah. Has there to, ever been a tissue analysis done to determine why the predators and flies won't come? No. Um, once again, there has been some tissue samples done on some cases in which ketamine, a drug called ketamine, was found. Is anybody familiar with it? Okay. Veterinarians use it. Now, I... I wasn't aware of it, and I worked vice narcotics for a number of years. And the reason why I wasn't aware of it, because on the street they refer to it as special K, okay? And, and that's a street, street jargon. Uh, veterinarians apparently like to use ketamine in an aerosol, and apparently, from my understanding, is that you can spray it into the muzzle of a horse or a cow and they stay conscious, and they will stay standing upright while the veterinarian can administer them medications or do what they're going to, going to do. And there have been, in a couple of instances, where ketamine has been found in tissue. The problem is, to do a narcropsy, and that's what you're all talking about, is very, 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 very expensive. And I told Bob we needed to do a narcropsy on uh, the case before, and he told me to get my checkbook. Okay, because you're probably looking at several thousand dollars doing narcropsy. By the way, narcropsy is what they do on animals, autopsy is what they do to humans, just so you know. And that's what it's going to take. And that's why it's important for you to support MUFON so that that type of research can answer those types of questions. My partner and I will go to the, as I tell people, I, with this guy, I'd walk into hell and spit in the devil's eye if I thought I could get the, uh, get the answer. But it takes money to do that. And by the way, all these investigations, all these uh, came out of our pocket. Probably on the, uh, on the uh, expedition down to the San Luis Valley on the case uh, that you saw, the fresh mute, 
uh, we probably, between Bob and I, spent close to $1,800. And that was uh, seven days that we spent down in the valley. Uh, that's I hate to think what it'd be now at, at almost uh, three bucks a gallon, but that was, this was 2000 and uh, that included gas, food, uh, lodging, and everything else. So there was, a, yes, ma'am. This one here? Oh, oh, the natural predation. Um, yeah, that one had been down for about two months. Yeah, uh, it had been struck by lightning and, uh, and the steer had been down for about two months. And there was no hesitation on the part of the uh, coyotes and uh, rodents and stuff to attack the carcass. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Correct. 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 Not at all. That would be strictly speculation, okay? I, I have some thoughts on it. My, my thought is that there's some kind of chemical or some kind of electrolysis that's used and predators, predators can sense that. And they know that, I, and the reason why I think that is that, yes sir? Oh, I've requested that you go to the mics because other people in the back can hear the questions. Um, I work, in my profession, I work very closely with the Division of Wildlife on certain cases. And uh, when I was at the Sheriff's Department, there was a problem with, and there still is, with uh, coyotes uh, in the county uh, because uh, they, you, you get a pair of coyotes one week and then and the next month you've got five, and then you got 10, and then you got 15, you got 20, and so you can see how they, the, the pack grows. And the problem is, is that poison, is a, is a common way of getting rid of coyotes. But the problem is, is that once you start using poison, the coyote senses it. Hey, Fred's not with us this morning, and uh, oh, he must have had some bad meat last night. They stay away from it. It'll work for a very short time, and you may get a couple of the coyotes, but the main core of that pack will survive because they instantly know that something's not right, and they will stay away from the bait. I've watched this over and over again. There will not be any tracks in the snow around the bait where you put out the poison because they know. So my theory, and strictly theory, is that some kind of electrolysis or chemical is used to incapacitate the cow that allows the whoever to get close to it and to do this. But that is strictly speculation on my part. That I, I, I could be wrong. My question is kind of along the same line, but um, I think normally predators or insects are drawn to odor. You know, it's, it's more of a smell thing for them. And so I was wondering if you had noticed a strange odor around the animal or if it had the smell of death. If, if something that they used took all the blood away, then it may not have the smell of death and, and, the, and they wouldn't be attracted to it for that reason. Well, that's a good point. My experience is that when you, you call the, 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 the smell of death, um, elk that I have shot, that Bob and I have uh, skinned out and butchered ourselves, um, no, there isn't that, that smell of uh, death that you refer to, at least not on the ones that are, are uh, mutilated. Now, there are cases, we had one case that we looked at that we think was a, a, a mutilation that was in process, but it wasn't completely fulfilled, and, and there was a lot of uh, uh, maggots and, and flies in the smell that you talk about. Yeah. Mm, thanks. You bet, thank you. Yes, sir. I was just wondering, I know that uh, the military now provides food in Saran, 
type wrappers, steaks to throw on the shelf for months because they've radiated them. A bacterial aspect of decomposition present in your first example, right. non-mutilated, and the third one, roughly the same period of time, if, if I understood you correctly, Correct. uh, indicated d dramatic differences in de true decomposition by bacterial. It would be cheap to take samples for bacterial culturation as opposed to the necropsy, and it would be possible that after something was done like this that they literally er erased bacterial traces penetrating it with radiation. That's all possible. Uh, one of the things that uh, Bob and I ran into, which kind of surprised me, is that uh, we had difficulty finding a veterinarian that was willing to do a necropsy on a mutilated cow. Very hesitant. They're, in fact, veterinarians are very hesitant to talk about animal mutilations to begin with. Now, that's another problem that you run into. It, it's not something that's going to be uh, readily acceptable in the scientific community. Uh, and so getting those types of t tests done, aside from the fact that it's very costly, is finding somebody that's reputable that was willing to do it. Yes, sir. Howdy. Uh, I was wondering if your partner said what year uh, his saucer sighting took place? I'm sorry, what's that? The saucer sighting, when, his, when your partner saw the saucer right. southwest of town? Well, what year that was? That would have been 74, 75 when, uh, when uh, Tom had the, the sighting. I'm not sure exactly when uh, Snippy or Skippy the horse was, I think it was, was mutilated, but it was in the 70s. So, yes, sir. In, in your reference to finding ketamine in the mutilated animal, what tissue was it found in? Uh, and it how many ca cases? The one that I'm uh, aware of uh, it was in Florida, and it was in the muscle tissue. The ketamine was found in the muscle tissue. Uh, there wasn't any soft tissue to do any test on. So uh, the ketamine, that uh, the one case that I'm aware of, it was found, I think, up in the shoulder portion of the muscle of the, of the uh, steer. And so the, uh, can I uh, assume then that the uh, carcasses that have been found in the San Luis Valley have not had tissue analysis done looking for ketamine, and that is because of the costliness of it? That's correct. There, there have been limited uh, tissue samples and limited uh, tests done on some of the carcasses, but no indication of any type of drug, uh, anesthesia or anything used on the animal. But once again, it's limited. And that, that brings up a good point, sir. In order, for, in order for me to test an animal for ketamine, it's a specific test. You just can't take a part of the tissue and run it through a gas chromatograph and it'll tell you that it's ketamine, you have to specifically test for ketamine. Otherwise, it won't show up under, like, uh, like if you do a urine test and you're testing for drugs and you run it through uh, the gas chromatic and it gives you a readout, okay, here's cocaine, here's uh, marijuana, here's uh, methamphetamine. Well, ketamine is a, is a unique drug and there's a number of them out there. You have to specifically test for it, otherwise it won't show up. And once again, that's a cost factor. Ketamine being a manufactured substance, if found, would would make me conclude that, that that's a smoking gun and that these mutilations are not alien uh, performed. I, I don't know that I would make, I, I understand what you're saying, but so they have, so the aliens have access to ketamine? I don't think so. I mean, no, what, the, what I'm saying is that I, I don't know that it, it may be a smoking gun and as to how they're doing it, but it doesn't necessarily point to the fact that it's government or human or ET. It's just a, a method of how they're doing it. I, uh, once again, h how are they getting close to the animal? I mean, there's a lot of other answer, unanswered questions. If I have a controlled environment and I have the animal sitting right here and it's in a cage and I can administer uh, ketamine through an aerosol, okay. But out in the open pasture in a herd of maybe 500 steers, I don't know, in the middle of the night. I have a second question. Sure. Uh, where the um, viscera, in cases where the viscera were removed, um, was the entry point in the pelvic region or was there also an abdominal or thoracic uh, opening? We have no way of knowing. We just know that it was removed and whether or not the entry was made uh, in the uh, anal portion or through the stomach or through the throat, 
But the case that you showed, this one here, did it have an opening in the chest or abdomen? If it didn't, then all the viscera has to be removed from the pelvic region. No, there was no opening in the abdomen, none whatsoever. Thank you. You bet. Okay, let me let me go to uh, <laughs> let me go to the next case. And uh, okay, the next case. I told you I can't help it. My humor gets ahead of me sometimes. This next case involves two police officers in Anchorage, Alaska. The year is uh, 1965 or 67. 65. Uh, they're in a helicopter. The pilot's a police officer for the Anchorage PD. The cameraman is a crime scene technician who is also a police officer. They're up there doing a uh, aerial uh, survey and photograph. They had a, they had a uh, uh, serious crime that occurred uh, just east of uh, Anchorage, and so they were doing a uh, photograph overlay. I believe it was a homicide. I'm not sure, but I think that was the specific case and the reason why they were up there. So they were taking an overview of the, of the uh, ground they were also employed by the Bureau of Land Management to do some aerial surveying. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management was going to expand the boundaries of, their, of the territory, so they wanted some uh, pictures. So that's the reason why uh, these two officers were up in the air. Now, the officer that took the picture and the pilot have died. They're deceased. But I have the negative of the photographs that they took. After the officer and the, and the well, after the two officers took the, took the photograph, they never said a word. They put the negatives in a safe deposit box, and that's where they remained until the year 2000. And the son of one of the police officers approached me and told me the story and gave me the negative. And the reason why the officers never said anything. By the way, that's not uncommon. I know of uh, four instances right now in my own department, and the officers won't talk about it. Not to me, not to anybody, but I know something happened. I've heard the dispatch tapes when the citizens called in that there's an object hovering over their house. So this officer puts the, uh, puts the uh, negative in a safe deposit box and it remains there until he passes away and his wife was going to destroy it. She was going to throw it in the fireplace and the son said, no, don't do it. And uh, ultimately contacted me and gave me the uh, photograph. Now the first one that you're going to see <clears throat> is, this is inside the helicopter. I believe this is the Yukon River just east of uh, Anchorage. And this is the windscreen of the chopper. Uh, this object here, I had the uh, uh, negative looked at professionally. And it's estimated that this object right here is five miles from the lens camera. All right? Now, we're able, we're able to determine that the helicopter is approximately 1,500 feet in the air. And that's because we're able to all right. Told you Murphy's Law. Um, the size of the trees was able to make a determination that it's approximate, that the, that the, uh, that the helicopter is approximately 1,500 feet in the air. Now, the story that was relayed to the son from his dad was that if you look closely, you can see that there's some cloud cover. And he caught movement out of the corner of his eye and thinking that it was another plane was telling the pilot that, hey, we've got another plane in our airspace. And then, of course, this object came out of the clouds. Five miles from the, from the uh, camera lens was able to make a rough estimate what the size of this thing that you're looking at. And it's equivalent to a mile high stadium. You could probably get 50, 60,000 people in there. So that gives you an idea of how big this craft is. Here's the second photograph. He zoomed in on it.
And that's the second photograph that he snapped before the object disappeared. Now, I've had numerous people look at this under a magnifying glass and they go, oh, that's a bolt with a washer through it. Okay, it, it may look like that to you, but this officer, and that's probably one of the reasons why he put it in the safety deposit box, because he didn't want to go down that road and have to stand tall in front of people ridiculing him for something that he had no control over. But if you look closely, it's not a bolt or a washer. There's thickness to it. There's something up on top of it, but you can't really see what it is. I would like to take that negative and have it enlarged and looked at and analyzed scientifically, but once again, we're talking cost. And uh, the chief won't give me any special funding for it. But uh, this, uh, this case illustrates a couple of things. And number one is that when I got into researching and investigating this problem, there were certain career fields that I thought should be reporting that. One was pilots, and they do. One was ranchers, and they do. And the other one was law enforcement. And the reason why is because these career fields are the ones that are out and about every day. You're not going to be able to see an unidentified object sitting here in this auditorium. You have to be out in the field. I think it was NICAP did a study on, on uh, career fields, and law enforcement and pilots and ranchers were ranked right up there, and understandably so. And I think that's what also gives it credibility, this problem, is that these are the very people that you would expect to see something unusual, unidentified, and they are. There's a, there's a close-up of, uh, of the craft. And like I said, if you look closely at the top, you can see that there's some kind of definition up there. I have no idea what that is, but it has thickness to it. Oh. Sure, works for you, but it won't work for me. I'm telling you, this is my first PowerPoint presentation, so Murphy's Law is really working overtime. Um, this is where people tell me, they go, well, that's nothing but a washer with a bolt through it. Well, it's not. It may look like it, and I can see where they come up with that, with that analysis. But uh, the, the initial, like I said, it was determined that the object, whatever it is, is five miles from the camera lens and probably at about uh, 10,000 feet. So however that officer was able to get that washer and that bolt five miles from his camera lens at 10,000 feet, my hat's off to him. So. And I love this one, I love Fireside. <laughs> I can't help it, but you know, it, it may be not too far from the truth. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm willing to entertain any uh, questions, comments, or whatsoever uh, concerning it. So thank you very much, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, since you're a member of the law enforcement organization, is there anyone within MUFON who's also involved in law enforcement that has ever considered starting like a law enforcement division within MUFON to educate law enforcement specifically? I mean, I would think that would be a real key thing to do. Not that I'm aware of. I, you know, um, just a little uh, uh, dovetail into uh, this whole problem. I was on the witness stand in the courtroom and the defense attorney <clears throat> was going to discredit me. Uh, it was a fairly significant case. Um, uh, the defendant was on trial for, uh, for uh, burglary and threatening uh, an individual with a gun. So his, 
the defense attorney, his tactic was to discredit me. And I'm up on the witness stand and the jury and the judge and everything. And he gets up and he goes, after the introductions and everything, he goes, so, Officer Storch, isn't it true that you chase flying saucers? Yeah, true story. And I looked at him and I go, no, that's not true at all. And the judge kind of looked at me and you could see the jury kind of leaned forward and, and, the, and the defense attorney goes, excuse me, are you telling this court that you do not chase flying saucers? And I go, yeah, counselor, I'm telling you, I do not chase flying saucers. I said, some of those craft have been clocked over 6,000 miles an hour, and if I was able to chase them, I wouldn't be sitting here. Now, I do investigate them, and I do research it, but I do not chase them. The jury enjoyed that answer. The judge enjoyed that answer, and he never asked me any more questions about flying saucers, and we got a conviction. <laughs> This is sort of a follow-up to the previous question. Uh, Richard Haynes uh, runs the organization NARCAP that many of you have heard of, which... Uh, uh, he specializes in pilots. Specializes in pilot reports. They take great pains of keeping confidential the reports to get from pilots, and I'm wondering if, uh, if, any, if you've heard of anyone trying uh, a similar effort for law enforcement to, you know, protect their confidentiality. No, I haven't. Um, I probably received somewhere in the neighborhood of 250, 300 emails a month from uh, law enforcement officers across the, from across the country and several from abroad, uh, a lot of them from England, uh, that are telling me about cases. And it's just, it, it, it literally overwhelms me. And I, and I try to respond back to every one of them because some of them are very good cases, but there just isn't enough hours in the day or, or days in the week to, to stay up with that. Uh, but in answer to your question, no, not that I'm aware of. No, not at all. Thanks. Yes, sir. Could, could you just give us uh, some idea of what the attitude within the law enforcement field is toward people like yourself that uh, are involved in research on UFOs? Is it like the general population in general, where there's maybe half the people who believe and you know 25% think you're crazy and et cetera? Is it? Is it uh... Oh, 25% don't think I'm crazy. They know I'm crazy. <laughs> right. Um, to answer your question, I, I get a lot of ribbing, and and 99% of it is in good nature. And I, I'm pretty thick-skinned, so I can, I can take a, 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 I like laughing at myself, so it entitles me to laugh at you. But um, some of it is pretty uh, sinister. I, uh, uh, one officer in particular accused me of doing the, uh, the devil's work, that, that I should stop what I'm doing immediately because I'll never get into heaven because, yeah. Um, and, I, and I just look at him going, well, okay, but I can't. I can't stop and I'm not going to. Most officers are pretty open-minded, and I think that in order to be a good law enforcement officer, you have to be open-minded. Being an objective skeptic, that's okay. I have no problem with that. I myself am an objective skeptic, but uh, I have an open mind, and I approach each and every case or call that I go on with an open mind. If you tell me that you've been robbed by three little green pigs and roller skates with squirt guns, I may chuckle, but I'm going to listen to your story and I'm going to take the report because who knows? Maybe that's exactly what happened. So, 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 so in most cases, then it makes sense to contact an officer if you have seen a, a flying saucer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You bet. Yes, sir. I have a question for you about the work of uh, a physician, MD. I think his name is Onshilter. Uh, are you familiar with any of his writings? No, I'm He's not. done tissue sample analysis a long time ago, that I'm, and I don't know now what the status is, but somebody uh, among the speakers may be familiar with that uh, work. Maybe uh, Linda I'd be Howell real interested in hearing that. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it.
Thanks for showing up this morning, and I hope that you find uh, my lecture not only entertaining, but uh, informative. I'm going to do something unprecedented. I'm going <clears> to <throat> do something unheard of. This morning, I'm going to step over the thin blue line and turn my back on my fellow colleagues in law enforcement and tell you how to get out of a ticket. <clears throat> Hey, this is serious biz, all right? <clears throat> and I'm going to use the example of a young lady in the city of Aurora. She woke up one morning and decided that she was going to drive one mile an hour for every day or for every year that she'd been on this planet, which was pretty cool. So she's going to get in her bright red Mercedes convertible and do one mile an hour for every birthday that she had on this planet. She was 91. The second problem was that she decided to do it in a 55 mile an hour posted speed zone. Sure enough, she gets popped by an officer with a uh, laser. By the way, folks, if you get hit with laser, stick a fork in you, you're done. That is one accurate in instrument. It will nail you down to the microsecond. Well, anyway, he pulls her over. He goes up to her and does the, ma'am, I need to see your driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. She goes, oh, officer, she says, I lost my uh, driver's license after my third DUI hit and run accident. <laughs> okay, okay. Can I see the registration for this nice new Mercedes? And she goes, well, it's not really my car, I stole it. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, officer, I, I just wanted one and I stole it. And the owner's in the trunk, I had to kill him in order to get it. Well, by this time, the officer's backing up, drawing his weapon, calling for backup. His supervisor arrives, his sergeant, says, what's going on? He tells him, says, hey, she doesn't have a driver's license, three DUI hit and run accidents, not her car, it's stolen. And she says the owner's in the trunk that she killed. So the sergeant warily approaches the lady and says, ma'am, you don't have a driver's license? She goes, well, yeah, sergeant, here it is right here. Looks at it and looks back at the officer and says, uh, is this your car? She goes, yeah, I've owned it for two years. Here's the registration and the insurance. So he's looking at it and looking back at the officer like, what the heck's going on here? He goes, ma'am, do you mind if I take a look in the trunk? And she goes, no, not at all, Sergeant. Uh, can I ask what the problem is? And he goes, well, supposedly you said that you killed the owner and you've got him in the trunk. And she looks at the sergeant and she goes, yeah, and I bet that lion bastard said I was speeding too. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> hey, try it. If you get away with it, let me know. <clears throat> Cops and flying saucers. Law enforcement's been involved in the UFO problem probably as long, if not longer, before the Air Force and the government was involved. Was a rodeo. He was a cowboy. He, he rode the PRC in his uh, off-duty hours. He rode bulls. In fact, that <clears throat> gentleman convinced me that I needed to climb up on a bull. And I did for 1.5 seconds. <clears throat> but he did that on his, on his off time. Now, if you know anything about cowboys and rodeo riders, they're a very conservative lot. Cops in general are very conservative. We're not very liberal minded and we hate change. And so Tom was not one to give to fantasy. He was a person that there were nights when, I, when he was training me, he maybe had said 100 words in a 12-hour shift. And keep in mind, I spent more time with him than I did with my wife. We were working 70, maybe 80 hours a week for the Sheriff's Department, 12-hour shifts. So I spent a lot of time with him. It took me three years to get this story out of him. First day that I showed up as a trainee, the other deputies were in the squad room. I get introduced to Tom. And right away, there were some snide remarks. Hey, Tom, you gonna show him what the aliens look like? And you could just see the red come up on his face. Well, we got in the car and I'm thinking, you know, I'm gonna ask him. And I did, and he looked over at me and he goes, newbie, don't talk to me, I'll talk to you. And we are not going to discuss this. And we didn't for three years. Three years I worked with this man, he never said a word what happened. Then one morning we were sitting up at Lookout Mountain, <clears throat> excuse me, 
And we were talking what guys usually talk about, girls, horses. Okay, girls. And <clears throat> out, of the, out of the blue, he looked over at me, and we were parked. I'm sure you've seen cops. They park. We, we call it heel to toe. As I, eyewitness testimony. There are no pictures. There is no forensic evidence. The eyewitness is a police officer. Now, skeptics will tell you, or they're quick to point out, that eyewitness testimony is unreliable. And I'm here to tell you that's a bunch of crap. Now, they, eyewitnesses may make mistakes. They may be inaccurate in certain details. They may not even be able to pick out the suspect in a photo lineup. But the fact remains that something very, or they witnessed something very traumatic, and certain details are accurate. And it's a starting point for an investigator. You have an eyewitness to an event. Tom Bove was a Jefferson County Sheriff's Deputy when I joined the Sheriff's Department back in 1978. He had been a Sheriff's Deputy for a number of years before I got there. In fact, he became my training officer. Um, I had not met him prior to. He ended up being a very good friend of mine. In fact, he was best man at my wedding. So that tells you how the relationship progressed over the years. The story that I'm about to relate to you took me three years to get the story out of him because he endured some incredible ridicule. In fact, he was threatened with his job by the sheriff, who at that time was Harold Bray of Jefferson County, Colorado. My interest in the UFO problem, I was involved in it long before I became a law enforcement officer. So that first day that I arrived, and I was a rookie, as they refer to as a newbie, and I was assigned to Deputy Bobe uh, as his trainee. Never met the man before in my life. Now let me give you some background on, on him so you get a feel for his personality. Tom, in it because that's the one agency that people can contact, the one government agency that people can contact. And not only will we answer the phone, but we'll send somebody out to talk to you. There are several good examples of cops involved with flying saucers, and I'm, if you followed this phenomena or this problem, I'm sure you're aware of it. Lonnie Zamora was a police officer down in New Mexico. Excellent case. I think Ted Phillips worked on that case. Uh, Val Johnson uh, was another officer up in uh, Warren, Minnesota, I believe it was. Uh, his encounter ruined his career. And that brings me to another point. This, for a law enforcement officer, and myself included, this is not a career-enhancing problem. If you're unlucky enough to have an encounter or you get dispatched to an encounter, it can literally ruin your career. And there have been several instances where officers have been forced to re either retire or resign from the profession because of what happened to them. A lot of uh, criticism and, uh, and uh, ridicule comes down on the officer because we're looked upon, and rightly so, as credible and trustworthy. And somehow, if an officer gets embroiled in an uh, uh, encounter, he or she all of a sudden loses their credibility. They're no longer trustworthy. And inside the department, the ridicule can be really intense. And I've experienced that firsthand. Fortunately, <clears throat> I can give it out as good as I can take. I think my, my sense of humor, if you haven't gathered by now, uh, gets me through a lot of difficult times. The first case that I'm going to talk to you about 